Hey, and welcome to Short Stuff. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and there's Jerry over there. And this is Short Stuff, so we should probably get talking about this right away. What are we talking about right now, Chuck? We're talking about an ancient, primitive animal, a beast that was around before dinosaurs, that survived ice ages. Wow. And that has been virtually unchanged since they made their way onto the scene as little <laughs> horseshoe crabs. Little horseshoe crabs. Still around, still kicking, still virtually unchanged after, I think I saw about 450 million years. Yeah, and still, when, you're, uh, when you have a child or when you were a child, when you go to the beach and you see one for the first time, <laughs> the question... What in the world is that to your parents? Right. Yeah, and they say, stop asking questions. They're crazy looking. They really are crazy looking. It looks like, um, how do you what, how do you describe a horseshoe crab? You think it looks I like you flipped over this. a wooden bowl and gave it a tail. Okay, great. We'll go with that. But it also has like a, it's a really tough exoskeleton. It's got six legs. If it's a male, the front two legs are hooks because it uses those for mating. Yeah, and the legs look like, you know, little crab claws. Yeah, and so it looks like a freaky, scary little thing. Even though it's called a horseshoe crab, it's actually much more closely related to spiders and scorpions. And once you realize that, number one, what it looks like makes sense. Number two, it becomes maybe the most terrifying thing you've ever seen in your life <laughs> yeah, they're in not person. Gonna, they're not going to hurt you, though. They're friendly. They are. They're fine. They don't want anything to do with you. They're, too, they're, they're old souls. They've been around too long to mess with you. But... We humans like to mess with them, and there's a reason why. And the reason is, is because they have a very peculiar kind of blood. It's copper-based, actually, so it's blue. And back in the 50s, a guy named Fred Bang, Frederick Bang, figured out that you can use horseshoe crab blood to identify whether there is um, harmful bacteria is present in, say, like a biological sample, a medical device, um, a vaccine, a new drug. And um, with that, I think 20 years later, it got FDA approval to use it for that use. Uh, it just began a horseshoe crab harvesting bonanza. All right, so we'll explain how that all works here in a sec. But um, let's talk a little bit more about the body of these guys and gals. Mm -hmm. Like we said, they have a big head. It's called a prosoma. And in that head is the brain and the heart, which is super cool. Uh, you already mentioned the six little claw legs. Uh, and then the males, the very first pair, are like hooks, and they used to clamp onto the female during mating. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is how that happens. The ladies dig a hole in the sand, mm. right. lay a, several thousand eggs, and the male hooks in, clings to her back, and fertilizes these eggs. And the coolest thing about all this is there are other males sort of in the area kind of hanging around. Yeah. And they're like, hey— if you know, if you've done, if you've done your thing, maybe give me a shot. <laughs> right, Th that guy, he was he was a real jerk, wasn't he? I'm a <laughs> nice guy. They're called satellite males. Yeah, but this, you know, the females can do this a few times per night for several nights in a row, and all in all, uh, a breeding female can lay about a hundred thousand eggs a season, which is great. So you're like, great, we're in the horseshoe crabs. The world is saved. Fantastic. But they also um, are a delicacy for shorebirds who fly up and down the, uh, the um, eastern coast of, the, of North America, of the um, Iraq, and they eat tons of these eggs. So even though a female might, might um, have like 10,000 of these and there might be a million mating pairs of horseshoe crabs in a single place, a lot of them get eaten by birds. Yeah, I mean, if you've ever been to Delaware Bay or seen pictures of just type in Delaware Bay horseshoe crabs, mm -hmm. it's like a beach made of horseshoe crabs during mating season. Right. So, it's remarkable. So, so the horseshoe crabs can deal with the shorebirds. It's fine. They've, they've been around for a very long time, um, and shorebirds have too, so they've learned to just kind of live with it. The problem is, is we humans have a big impact on horseshoe crabs as well. We like to catch them and use them for bait, and we also develop in the areas where they mate and reproduce, and so we eat up their habitat. So when you put those together with shorebirds eating thousands and thousands and thousands of, of eggs that could have been little tiny new horseshoe crabs, their population has, um, it's under strain. And that's just the population in the United States. It's actually far worse in uh, Asia. Yeah. And you know what? Let's take a break. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, how they benefit the humans and what's going on in America with this research and in Asia. 
right after this. Okay, Chuck, we're back. So I think I mentioned that you can actually use horseshoe crab blood to um, in the biomedical industry. It's it's virtually priceless. Although there is a price for it, it's just really expensive. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fifteen thousand dollars a quart. Wow, making it one of the most valuable fluids on earth. And this is specifically the clotting agent that's that expensive. It's called LAL, uh, limulus or limulus amoebocyte lysate, mm-hmm. and it is in their uh, blue blood. And it is a supreme clotting agent, as it turns out. Yeah, and the reason why it's a great clotting agent is because that's how horseshoe crabs fend off infection on their own. Um, In your body, you have white blood cells and you have all sorts of veins that your body can kind of close off and surround a a foreign invader a pathogen in, right? Well, blood just flows freely all throughout the horseshoe crab. Yeah, they got no blood vessels. They don't. It just kind of moves through their tissues and their organs and everything. It's just it just sloshes around everywhere in there. Pick one up and shake it. You'll hear it just plain as <laughs> don't day. Don't do that. No, don't do that. But the the fact that the blood can just move around very easily means that they have to have a very specialized type of blood cell that can do everything. So I guess it's a generalized type of blood cell if you think about it. And that's what they have. And these blood cells, when they encounter a pathogen, they clot like crazy around that thing because that is their immune response. They they basically sequester it in a big gob of goo, <laughs> a gob of goo. Right. So we figured out that we could use this LAL. And the way that we originally um, started harvesting this was from rabbits because uh, I guess rabbits have, I don't think as much, right? Well, they don't have specifically the same thing, and we didn't harvest it from them. We would just inject them with a, a drug that we were testing. Oh, okay. And see if they got an infection. And then whether they did or not, we'd just kill them when we were done with them anyway. Gotcha. So the fact that we are able to use horseshoe crabs has saved rabbit lives. Yes. So we can feel good about that on one hand. Right. Um, but here's the deal. Horseshoe crabs can survive about four days out of the water. So if you want to harvest this crab blood or this spider scorpion blood, <laughs> you pick one of these horseshoe crabs up. Uh, they like females because they're much bigger. I don't think we said they can be um, much, much larger than the males. Yeah, like by half, I think. Yeah, 50% larger. Mm-hmm. And so they bring them out. They bring them to the lab. They chill them for an hour, put them on ice. Then they mount them to a rack. And keep in mind, they're alive this whole time. And they insert a needle around the heart into that tissue. Mm-hmm. And they drain about 30% of the blood from these horseshoe crabs and try and get them back in time to survive. Um, it looks like, like I said, four days out they can survive. I imagine probably less in a traumatic situation like this. Right. But they like to get about a, a, a what, a 70% survival rate in America? Yeah. I mean, they want even higher than that, but what it washes out to is that they have about about a third – about 30% of the horseshoe crabs that they harvest and put back end up dying. And they think that it's not the bloodletting process. They've got the blood, the bleeding process down pretty well, down to a science, basically. It's how, how they're caught, transported, sure. and handled during this process that can kill them, that they think that that's usually what kills them. Um, so if you're, if you're talking about like 600,000 uh, horseshoe crabs being harvested every year, in the United States alone, thirty mm-hmm. percent uh, of that—that's a lot of dead horseshoe crabs that would otherwise still be alive. That, and this is the point. I mean, aside from the fact that we're killing horseshoe crabs be- for our own purposes, um, if we—if those things survived, they regenerate their blood, and we can bleed them again. It's not like a once in right. a lifetime thing. And they tag them so that they don't overbleed them too much. But um, the, the you know thirty percent of them dying—that's a—that's a big problem because. That's just a big loss of that blood market down the line. 